We are back with another exciting episode of Metallicus Live. Here to talk with us about his brand new book, Big Tech and Finance, How to Prevail in the Age of Blockchain, Digital Currencies, and Web3. We have the award-winning author, Igor Page, with us here today. Igor, thank you so much for hopping on. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for Metallicus uh, for having me on the show. Uh, you have a great podcast, and I'm really happy to be here chatting with you today. Likewise. I'm happy to have you here. So for those that don't know about Igor Page, um, his first book um, is Blockchain Babble. Um, and when did that come out? It came out in 2019, actually. So quite some long time ago in crypto, crypto, spa, crypto space. A long time, and long time indeed. Um, now, this past month, this past month in May, um, it was about early May. I, I was reading that it was May 2nd. Um, your new book, Be Tech and... Or, let me get that title right there. Big Tech and Finance. It came out on May 2nd initially. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, it came in. It came out beginning of May in uh, actually the whole world except the United States and Canada. So it launched in North America just this week. So it's a, it's a brand new title. Just this week on May 30th. And correct. where can people find that book? It's basically available in all major bookstores on Amazon and also Barnes & Noble and all of the other big ones. So I think if you're looking for it, you'll definitely find it. I think so too. I checked it out on Amazon. I'm ordering it, just waiting for it to ship as we speak. But if everybody is on that site, be sure to check out that sample that you can read on Amazon. It shows you uh, the introduction, the first chapter about um, about how Big Tank is El Dorado, and then the final thoughts. I definitely recommend people check that out. But Igor... The book just launched in the United States and Canada this week. How does it feel? To put it very, very simply, it feels awesome. So, you know, you're working on something, you're putting a lot of time and effort in it. And then there's two big milestones. So the first one is when you hold the physical copy of the book, the first one. Uh, and the second one is obviously when it hits the market. This is where the rubber meets the roads. That's where you basically see if people are liking what you're writing, if they're having interest, or if basically you've wasted a lot of time. Um, and this is... It's super exciting, and it's super exciting to get out to speak to the people, to speak to the media, to write about the topic, uh, because there's a lot of buzz and excitement about the book and about the topic, and it's it's really a great time every time a book launches awesome. into the market. Absolutely, and um, I can see it over on our on our Riverside chat. Is that the book back there behind you? Yes, correct, correct. So that's that's the new one, and the black one in the back is the old one, the Blockchain Babble from 2019. Yeah, I like the publisher did a good design work, I think, in terms of the cover, cover as well. Absolutely. It, it must feel so real just holding that book in your hand and just, like you said, all of that years of work. Did you get started on the book um, right after Blockchain Babel or was it at the same time? How, how long have you been writing the book? I didn't start immediately afterwards, to be honest. Uh, and uh, as I said, I've been working on that for quite a long time. Uh, though I have to say it's much, much faster than the first one. So the first one, I think, took me about three years to complete. This one was in total about one and a half years. Though I have to say that, you know, the biggest phase was definitely the research uh, phase. Uh, but it's also one of the most exciting things, right? Talking to people and it talks really to all kinds of different stakeholders uh, that are somehow connected to to the new blockchain age and or to the finance age. Um, and then Writing it was surprisingly quick. Uh, you know, you get used to those things. If you're writing regularly for a couple of years, it goes quickly. And then you have a very long phase as well where, where you're, you know, just checking it, editing it, stuff like that, preparing the book launch, which is basically the phase where you can't wait until it's over and then the book finally hits the shelf. For sure, for sure. And now it's hit that shelf. So, yeah, let's talk about that. You said... um I was reading on the summary of the book and the description in Amazon, and uh, the book draws on in-depth interviews with founders, investors, regulators, bankers, and tax experts. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this is also, um, you know, really what's what's been driving the whole idea of this book because I was um, very fortunate that uh, the first one, Blockchain Babble, was really quite successful. You know, it was a Financial Times book of the month, won a couple of awards and so on. Uh, and it enabled me basically to speak to a lot of people, uh, a lot of highly interesting, high level people from all kinds of uh, industries that are somehow, as I said, connected to this blockchain world. Uh, you know, I was very well connected in the financial world because I'm, I'm a banker, have been a banker for quite a long time. Uh, but through Blockchain Babel, as you mentioned, 
I was able to speak, you know, some to some very um, high high up managers uh, in terms also in, in regulators, politicians. Uh, you know, I spoke to founders who basically made a fortune on crypto and blockchain applications, lost everything, and are now again back on the hunt for the next big big thing in finance. I talked to tech executives, I talked to uh, banking executives, to investors, uh, basically to everybody to some who somehow had um, any kind of touch point with the topic. Uh, and um, the one thing that they all told me about, so they have very differing viewpoints, very differing ang- different angles. Uh, but the one thing that they all agreed upon uh, was that the entry of big tech into finance was the biggest thing to come in, in the financial services industry, the biggest thing in the last couple of decades, because it was a very transformative force. Uh, and this is why it was was so interesting, as I said, to talk to those people, many off records, uh, which was uh, even sometimes even more interesting because they were talking very openly, right? And, and sharing their fears and their hopes. Um, and it was an extremely enriching experience. And this is why investing all of this time uh, was worth it, uh, no matter what. Nice. So out of like the, the select groups and individuals and their respective industries, which was the most trickiest of trying to interview or get insights from? It was quite tricky with politicians and regulators, you know, because they are always trying to be diplomatic, trying to not say anything wrong. This was, I think, the, the most difficult to access. Um, the, the easiest group, on the other hand, were the entrepreneurs, uh, which is also a bit interesting because, you know, usually you would expect they would uh, be a bit skeptical of sharing their insights, but they were very open. Uh, they were talking very directly, very plainly. Uh, but uh, the good thing is uh, they, the people really, and I'm really grateful for that, they gave me uh, quite a lot of their time. I had really in-depth interviews, often stretching for two hours, sometimes even more. Uh, and you know you develop kind of a, a kind of a uh, you know a, a very good basis for speaking about those things. Uh, and I wouldn't say there was any interview that didn't have at least something that surprised me in it, or something where I learned something new in it. Uh, and uh, so so it was really every industry, every every actor group had kind of its um, very interesting and unique angles to tell. Was there a particular? Thing that was said that was so eye-opening for you or just such a revelation for you yeah actually there was there was um because usually you go into those interviews and right so at the beginning of the book you you have your concept you you have been dealing so i have been dealing with blockchain for a number of years for you know i've been working at the intersection of tech and finance for more than a decade and you think you, you know it all kind of uh, or at least you know where the thing is going. But sometimes you go into an interview and after two hours, you are, I wouldn't say changed by 180 degrees in what you believe, but <laughs> you, you, you're you changing quite a lot, your your view. And one of the interviews that stuck with me was with uh, George Selgin, who was um, actually one of the first cypherpunks, but he was a monetary economist. So he was not even a techie, which, which made it even more um, remarkable. Uh, and he was, George, um, so, so Nick Sabo called him, uh, a big inspiration, you know, all these these first cypherpunks were really looking into his work on uh, free banking, you know, the libertarian aspect of, of the Austrian school of economics and so on. And and I talked to him particularly about stable coins, private stable coins, CBDCs. And, uh, you know, I was a very big uh, advocate of CBDCs before that. I, I still think they have a very important role to play. But after that interview, I understood the real danger uh, that uh, CBDCs, for example, could pose. And I'm not talking about privacy aspects because this was something that I knew before because uh, I was, of course, obviously, um, have done a lot of research on that. And it's pretty clear that CBDCs give you uh, huge powers. <clears throat> I was not so much afraid, you know, in the United States or Europe where you have still functioning and very strong democracies where you can still, uh, you know, um, have institutions that are um, looking at data privacies and punishing misbehaving actors, where there's no such thing as a too big aggregation of power. Um, but but I talked to, when I talked to Selgin in particular, um, I understood that it's about much much more than privacy. Actually, actually, it's about the innovative strength uh, of the crypto market of the blockchain market. Uh, because what happens that uh, when you, as a central bank, enter a market? Of course, you can still allow private stablecoin issuers to exist. Uh, of course, under certain regulations that you need, uh, but still you're competing with them and you can never compete fairly with them. 
right? If I'm a central bank, if I'm the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or whoever, uh, and I am competing with banks whom I also regulate them at the same time, it cannot be a fair competition. Um, and the second thing is also, uh, I'm not just uh, that I'm regulating them, but I can also not fail. I can also not, I can never fail commercially, right? The central bank can never fail. They can pump money as much as they want uh, into 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 a project, into a certain effort and initiative. Uh, so it's not really this perfect free market uh, economic economics or free market principles. Uh, so you have to be very very careful uh, if you're going into stable coins and if if you're you know, really as a central bank deciding um, to take uh, you know a try at the market and a go to at the market and. Uh, because one thing still rings in my ears with that he said is that uh, it was actually private innovation um, that made, you know, made us strong, that made in particular the U.S. dollar strong, uh, not so much central bank innovation. And this is this is clear because central banks, it's not their task to innovate, not their primary task, at least that their primary task is fight inflation, fight unemployment. Uh, but it was always the private sector, private um, companies, private banks that came up with innovation, whether that be paper money or something else. Wow. That must have been a lot to take in at that time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. But that's why I said that's that's why these these interviews and these talks were so rewarding because uh, you know, people really took the time and they talked to you and I threw all of my objections at him. You know, I said, okay, you need it, you know, you have interoperability and all the other arguments in favor of CBDCs. But basically then uh, if you get into this a, a deep, deep talk level, then uh, it makes all the difference. Indeed, indeed. So do you think your book is coming out at a very crucial time um, with the intersectionality of blockchain and banking, especially these past couple months? Yeah. Well, first of all, we have to say that, uh, you know, big tech has been pushing into finance for years, at least since the beginning or since the rise of the smartphone, or at least since the iPhone 6, which had the first NFC chip in there which enable us to do mobile payment, the Apple wallet and stuff like that. So so this is uh, this is a push. This is a, a trend that has been going on for quite a long time, for many years, uh, I would say even more than a decade. In China, even earlier than uh, we had in the US or Europe and uh, the other countries. Uh, but this, uh, you're right, it is, it is really a crucial time at the moment because the whole banking sector is kind of, uh, you know, looking not anymore at, at those innovative things but they're concerned with uh, financial stability, with liquidity. Uh, regulators are concerned with this as well, um, which is, of course, a reason why the the, the focus of uh, bankers and regulators is now a bit moving away from all of those blockchain uh, and innovation uh, topics. Uh, at the same time, you know, while they're moving away, uh, if you look at the big tech companies, uh, and Apple is the best point in case here, uh, they are not waiting, right? So they are not uh, they are not concerned with with what is happening to Silicon Valley banks and the others. And uh, we saw that best now when Apple came out with their savings account, with their Apple Pay Later products, and so on. So uh, it is a crucial time indeed, and I think that the timing is very well and very timely. Uh, that the trend of the book, yeah, yeah. And um, you mentioned five big tech companies in the book, and one of them was Apple, like you said, correct. And that yep. also included um, Google, Microsoft. Hey, can you remind me of the next two, please? It's Facebook or Meta uh, and Amazon, of course. So these are the big five. Yeah. And so it's it's it's. I would, no, sorry, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead, please. No, so so it's 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 the five I, five big ones in 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 um, you know the U.S. and Europe, and then you have three in China, which is uh, Baidu, uh, which is their search engine. Then you have. Uh, Alibaba, which is the, the Amazon of China, if you want. And then you have, um, uh, of course, Tencent, which is the Facebook of China. So those those are the three that, due to the strength of the internal market, because it's huge, are also considerable as, as big techs. So it's five plus, plus three, three, if you absolutely. want. Absolutely. And so, and that's interesting um, that you brought up the, um, the pay later option and the banking on Apple. Um, because like you said, it's been about 10 years since that was, the groundwork was first laid out. Um, on Apple's side, and now you see other instances of where Facebook's trying to get involved um, in banking. You got um, Google in some way, shape, or form with like the Google Pay as well. So it does seem like they all work hand in hand, not maybe with each other, but um, of bringing digital currencies and technology into the forefront, especially in this 
new age when, when it comes to the banking. Definitely. Uh, it, it, it's exactly as you said, right? So um, actually, I think that we are seeing today a radical change in financial services that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. Uh, and uh, you mentioned those big five. Um, I would say I particularly focused on four of them. I didn't focus so much on Microsoft because Microsoft is more kind of uh, positioning themselves as an enabler, as a technology provider also for uh, incumbents. It might change with the metaverse and web free, right? Because they're very strong in those technologies that are kind of gatekeeper technologies or new platforms. But I focus very much on the four. And it's interesting to see that each of those four big tech companies has a different strategy. Like Apple, uh, I think they are possibly the least innovative uh, when it comes to financial services because, you know, they would, uh, we have no trace, whatever, uh, that they touched crypto, that they touched blockchain. So they, there was, a couple of years ago, there was some kind of patent where they mentioned blockchain in a footnote or something like that. But other than that, there was nothing from Apple's side. Yet they're extremely good uh, when it comes to offering financial services and, and really capturing a market. Uh, you mentioned uh, also uh, the, the savings account, uh, which is a very strong indication that they are uh, expanding horizontally in the financial services space, meaning that uh, they have not just the payment sector, but now they're also offering accounts. You have Apple Pay Later, which is kind of going into lending. So they're they're growing horizontally, but at the same time, they're also growing vertically. So um, Apple employees call this the, uh, you know, they, they specifically refer uh, to this project as breakout, right? Because they want to break out as much of the value chain from banks and other incumbents uh, by insourcing it in-house. And this includes, for example, risk uh, assessment, right? So this is a very core competence of banks, which is done by Apple. And then you look at others um, like Amazon, for example. Amazon, which is extremely strong in blockchain. So, um, And I, I remember that this really came overnight because I was uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article in the American Banker saying that, you know, actually, if you look at management strategy and all of the theories that we had in the past, uh, that it would be very wise or it's actually just a matter of time until big tech gets into finance with the help of blockchain technology because it enables them to spread not just from payments but also to other segments of finance uh, and what happened is that amazon said uh, no we're not interested in blockchain at that time just just a couple of, of, of weeks after my article their ceo said so but then a couple of months later aws which is the cloud computing arm of amazon came out and they had said okay now we're having a blockchain as a service platform hosted blockchains and they became the second or the, the largest, actually the largest uh, uh, platform for building end-to-end -end blockchains worldwide. Uh, today, we know that they're running most of the Ethereum nodes, for example, also on their hosted infrastructure. So Amazon is really a big, big player. Google pretty much runs the same strategy. Also, blockchain as a service. And what many don't know, Google was um, actually at one point in time, the second largest investor into blockchain technologies and blockchain companies in the world of all companies. So uh, they're doing a lot, even though they might not be communicating so much about it. And then, of course, we have Facebook or Meta with Libra. I don't know if you want to talk about that or if if, if, if you if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free. It kind of sounds like when you think of the term blockchain, it started to... It's in finance, of course, but the way blockchain is becoming, it sounds like it can be more than just finance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And like, what other ways? Do you, do you have any predictions um, of what's next to come from blockchain? Well, it's, it's. Um, I would say that I'm seeing now a push towards decentralized blockchains within big techs in particular, a slight push. Uh, because in the, in the beginning, it was uh, merely centralized blockchains. It was use cases, uh, not just for big tech, but generally for big companies uh, in areas such as supply chain, right? Where this is, it's pretty clear that blockchains, if you have this highly efficient, transparent ledger um, that, that you can uh, actually um, save a lot of money, a ton of money. So this was a no-brainer for many companies, big techs included. Now what we're seeing is also a kind of a push into the crypto world. So a couple of years ago, big tech companies were very, very skeptical of crypto you weren't allowed to advertise ICOs or any kind of investments into crypto uh, on Google or Facebook or whatever. Uh, they're slowly starting to open that up. Uh, they're allowing uh, ads, you know, 
then Tesla is not technically a big company, but they even allowed for a short time to buy cars with Bitcoins. You have telecommunication companies that allow you to pay their bills in cryptocurrencies. Uh, and also you have Apple Pay, Google Pay opening up their wallet. You have the credit card companies opening up, warming up to, to cryptocurrencies. So this is kind of uh, what I believe also a first indication uh, that those big tech companies will also go into that direction. And that's exactly what we saw with Libra, which is the which was the huge project that, that Facebook had uh, in 2019. Facebook actually was heading an alliance of like-minded companies and they wanted to, uh, for those of you who don't remember, they wanted to uh, build a global super currency called Libra uh, that in the beginning even was supposed to, to be pegged to a number of, of um, fiat currencies, whether that be the dollar, the euro, the pound, whatever. Uh, and this was, I think, the best, also the best example of how ambitious, how audacious uh, those big tech uh, initiatives can become. So this was really not just, you know, threatening commercial banks, but this was threatening central banks. It was threatening almost the sovereignty of certain countries. And this is why regulators across the world stood up. Uh, and this was actually also what, what got the whole CBDC wave rolling. Now, of course, Facebook later tried to, to uh, you know, renegotiate with lawmakers. They said, okay, we would have a US dollar-based Libra, a, a, a Euro-based Libra, and so on. They even rebranded as DM, uh, but it didn't help. You know, they, they made a lot of mistakes in the way they, um, they launched their currency or they launched the idea. Uh, and, and this is, of course, then um, uh, uh, before, uh, before it even could be launched, the project was then sold off to, to Silver Bank, uh, and it's, it's actually dead at the moment, that, which doesn't mean that, that Facebook is not working uh, further in the crypto space, especially with their efforts around the metaverse, you know, even rebranding their own company as Meta or the holding company at least as Meta. Yeah, and so do you think moving forward, there's going to be a lot more attempts, not not probably not by the folks that we have just named maybe there could be some other players that come in but do you think companies and big tech and tier two tech which i would like to talk about in a moment do you think a lot more folks are gonna try to keep pushing like pushing for regulators to come around definitely definitely i think i think really that the blockchain is opening up the arena uh for financial services, but as you said, it also for all kinds of other industries, um, because it is simply a disruptive technology. And I always, you know, I know that the term disruption and disruptive is tossed around oftentimes, and people don't really know what it means. Uh, so if if we look at, uh, you know, how management theory defines it, they said that a technology is disruptive if it changes the ways uh, that a certain market competes, and this is exactly what happens with blockchain, right? Just think of um, cross-border payments of remittances. We had remittances of 7 to 10%, sometimes even more, and now it's practically down to 0 or 1%. Uh, it doesn't take you all of the infrastructure that the Western Union might have had, you know, with 200 countries, local agents and stuff like that. All you two is, need to have is two wallets and you can send around value. And this is really a disruptive, uh, a disruptive tech. Uh, and you also mentioned the second important uh, important thing, which is regulation and talking to regulators. Uh, and I think that this is the big question mark, the big black box, where we still don't know uh, when they will come around in certain countries uh, <clears throat> and how how they will regulate it. Uh, and this will, I think, definitely impact uh, who will end up at the top at the end of the day. For sure, because it's just it's all on the regular. Well, I always say it's all on them, but. A lot of eyes are on mm. regulators. Is that a fair assessment to make? Definitely, definitely. And um, especially in the United States now, because uh, in, in Europe, for example, with the MICA, the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation that just was passed by the European Parliament uh, last month, uh, you know, you have, it's, it's not a perfect piece of legislation, but at least you have a very clear um, rule set. You know what you need to do. You know what kind of licenses you need to do. You know what is allowed, what is not allowed, which company can offer crypto assets, what you need to do if you're taking crypto assets. Uh, and as I, again, I don't think it's perfect. I think there's a lot of things to be improved, especially in the stablecoin area. Uh, but if you compare this to the, to this, this to the U S uh, then of course the U S definitely has to, has to, um, create some clarity because that's, uh, that's, I think at the moment, the most important issue because a lack of clarity uh, is one of the biggest killers of innovation at the end of the day, because you have to put money, you have to put effort into something. 
And at the end of the day, you may, might get a Wells notice and <laughs> have to pay millions of fines. And that's not what you want to do. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> so <laughs> now that the book is launched, is there like certain folks where you believe like, yeah, you really need to read this book? Maybe like a regulator, you know, or um, someone in any industry where you can think off the top of your head that really needs to read this book, read tech and finance? Yeah. So, so the number one target group, I would say, is all of the professionals in financial services, executives, or basically anybody working or interested in the industry. Uh, and I will just don't mean traditional banks or traditional players such as credit card companies. I also mean fintechs. I also mean entrepreneurs in the blockchain space and so on. So it's more kind of a strategic aspect and now a very, very detailed technical account. Um, so it's really trying to explain where the market is moving and what you have to do in the mid and long term to succeed in it. Um, and of course, it's it's helpful for regulators. It's helpful for um legislators for politicians i think that they should as well understand what is going on what's the rationale uh that uh companies and then other all, basically all kind of the actors in this space uh have to have what inspired you to write this book especially about the intersectionality between blockchain digital currencies and web3 mm -hmm. yeah very good question so i mentioned in the beginning uh, that after after I wrote Blockchain Babylon, I was I was I had the privilege to talk to a lot of people, and basically I have to admit I was also asking a bit what what is on their mind, what's the biggest uh, topic, because I, I wanted always to be on top uh, of things and, or of the future trends. You know, everybody knows about today's trends, but it's very difficult to find a future one. And they mentioned the entry, yeah, definitely, and they mentioned the entry of big tech into finance. And you know, having had the experience of writing the first book, having had the experience of having, um, you know, dealt with blockchain, researched it in the de in detail, that this that's why I, I saw that, okay, they're not just entering finance and they're not just staying with the payment sector and the payment segment, but taking blockchain um, is something that can uh, enable them to go into other aspects as well. And just to give you some examples, because China in many, in many ways, um, it's a different market. We can't really compare it to the US or so. Um, because they they leapfrogged a lot of a lot of technological levels and they don't have the same history, uh, but we have the big techs there uh, using the blockchain to do things just cross border payments using that to so Tencent for example built a virtual blockchain based bank for uh, supply chain financing, right? So this is something completely different to what's the core business of big tech because we understand that they are into payments, right? Because uh, they are platform businesses. They're doing everything uh, in order to make their platforms more attractive. Uh, and making platforms more attractive is definitely there by providing free payment services like Alipay did in China. But as I said, um, it's it's not the same like having supply chain um, finance. And Ali, uh, Alibaba uh, and um, its um, financial arm uh, and financial, uh, they are also thinking of going into asset management and so on. So these are very different areas which would have been completely out of reach if it hadn't been for distributed ledger uh, and everything everything that came with them that's interesting that's interesting so you talk about even just now we're just talking about some strategies that um some of the biggest players are considering and trying to leverage in the emergence of all of these aspects such as blockchain digital currencies web3 but is there a particular strategy that any of them, any of them are doing that you don't particularly like or don't support, in your opinion? Well, it's it's difficult to say what I don't like because they are, uh, you know, I think they're all of them pretty much leveraging their big, their big strengths, uh, like Amazon and Google. I said they're very strong in infrastructure. That's why they're providing blockchain as a service, which makes absolute sense. Um, to me, a big question mark is Apple. I said uh, that they are not really um, doing much on blockchain, but what I actually meant was that they are not publicly doing much on blockchain. Uh, and if we look at, uh, you know, past big tech efforts, not necessarily blockchain ones, but generally the big projects, they were all kept secret and launched overnight. Just to give you an example, uh, when Amazon launched AWS, so their, their cloud computing arm, uh, nobody was talking about it until one day all of a sudden they said, okay, we're having this cloud computing infrastructure and within record time, 
they became the world's leader. Uh, and uh, Apple has surprised us quite often, right? And there's a lot of a, a big degree of secrecy of, of around Apple's roadmap. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised that if after all of this period of, of being very silent, they came up with something uh, really, truly groundbreaking. So this is something um, that that is a question mark. Uh, what I thought was a, a little bit of a strategic mistake was Meta, uh, you know, Facebook's um, effort into the metaverse. Um, and because it was a mistake in timing, I think that Web3 is definitely real. So we will have more and more um, digital assets, crypto assets, um, having more and more use cases for them. Uh, but I believe that technology was not there and the, um, you know, the, the, the pivot that Mark Zuckerberg did was far too early. It should have come three or five years later, or maybe not at this massive pace, right? So they were hiring tens of thousands of engineers to work at the metaverse. And of course, shareholders punished them. <laughs> and that they did. That they did. So, so you say you feel it was too early for them to make that. Pivot. Yeah, definitely. So. We talked a lot about um, big tech, and we listed out um, the examples in the book: the, your Apples, your Microsoft, your Alibaba. We we already mentioned that, um, but you also talk about tier two tech in the context of the financial yeah. industry. Um, can you define what the tier two tech is and why it's important that there's a difference? Yep. So basically. Um... Big tech, we said for me, it's just five companies in, in, in the US and, and so on. So five big companies and everything else is tier two techs. So all of the other big, important technology companies, be that IBM, PayPal, and so on. So all highly impressive companies who have corporate valuations in the hundreds of the billions. Uh, and uh, But they are not there where big tech is at the moment. Because if you look at, I always find it impressive to look at the um, you know top 10 of the world's most valuable companies. Uh, and 10, 15 years ago, you would get nine out of 10 companies being in things such as oil, banking, you know, natural resources. Uh, fast forward 10 years, and today we have seven out of the 10 top companies being tech giants. So the five, Euro, five American ones plus two Chinese ones, uh, then you might have a bank and so on. But uh, basically all of them are at, the, at, at really the top of the corporate valuation charts. And you know, even if you compare it to to historic dimensions, to the Carnegies and to the to the Rockefellers, you know their their power and their wealth fails or or, or is is really nothing compared to what we have today with those big tech companies. So I think they're really the the, the uh, most powerful companies in the history, probably that we had uh, economic history with an incredible global reach. And what differentiates them from the tier two tech uh, is that they have. In, in not just one, but a couple of crucial industries, they have either a monopoly or a duopoly. Just think of advertising where you have Facebook and you have uh, Google or think of hardware where you have, um, you know, Apple or think of, uh, you know, search where you basically have only Google and so on. So it's multiple industries. And tier two tech is still important um, because they might not have the resources today that they have. Uh, but if they manage to leverage this new tech, if they manage to leverage the promise of blockchain technology, they might become one of tomorrow's big tech companies because they already have massive resources. They have well-known brands. They have, uh, you know, uh, good profitability, solid corporate performances. Uh, so if there is a challenger, I believe it could be really coming from this tier two tech layer. Uh, maybe just uh, also as another another tidbit for management theory, we know that every time or in most of the times that an industry is disrupted, it actually comes from a very powerful firm in another industry, right? So we call that diversifying market entrance. So it's usually not the startup working in your garage that, uh, you know, overthrows an industry overnight, but it's usually a dominant player from another, another industry. Just think of uh, the smartphone market, right? So it was before the smartphone, it was Nokia, Siemens. And then you had Apple, which was a dominant player in computing, and they understood, okay, we can apply our core competencies in phones because the phones are becoming small computers. So they were already a big company, and then they grew super big. And this is what uh, the IBMs and PayPals and SAPs or whoever could become as well if they manage uh, to, to get this new wave of technology right and the timing right. So one of the main takeaways or actionable insights 
that readers can expect to gain from reading your book, Big Tech and Finance? So, of course, I try to, to you know, um, give a little bit of an overview of, of all of the areas uh, that will be kind of arenas of competition, such as DeFi and so on, uh, all kinds of different assets, CBDCs, stable coins, and so on. But I think that the major, a major takeaway uh, is that whoever will succeed, I believe, will need to build what I call the super money engine. So this is something that is basically um, building a capability to handle all kinds of assets at once. So on the one hand, it will be traditional finance. So you will have fiat currencies, but you will have cryptocurrencies. You will have CBDCs. You will have private stable coins. You will have all the non-fungible tokens, obviously. So you will be able, you'll have to be able to, to deal with all of them at once in one place. And at the same time, you'll have a, to have a very strong execution capability, meaning that uh, you will be have to be able within that platform to have smart contracts, to have an exchange functionality, uh, you know, to buy assets, to stake assets, to borrow them, to put them into autonomous protocols. Um, so there's there's a lot of plus, of course, the whole uh, traditional finance sector, right? So you still have to be able to let somebody buy and sell shares if they want, or, or securities, or whatever. So it's it's really who will build build the strongest engine in a multi asset world uh, that will really uh, make the difference and that will enable a company to to uh, you know ha realize a lead as compared to the other companies. This is just such an awesome conversation with you, Igor. I'm gonna just tell you that right now. <laughs> Thank you. I, I of course realize that Metallicus is going a little bit in the same direction, so um, I think that's 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 a good that's a good way forward. Oh, you think so? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, handling multiple types of assets, you know, not just being focused too narrowly uh, on one of them. So I think that's um, that's definitely what some companies are now realizing. Uh, and of course, it's it's really a huge endeavor to build a, an engine that can really handle everything. But at least we have first efforts. I love that. And I love that. And that's just a massive shout out to my, all my friends here <laughs> at Metallicus. We, we're doing something right. We're doing everything we can in our to do it right. Excellent. I love that for us. Now, um, I have like a, another question or two, um, but Igor, if it's good with you, uh, we can extend it out um, if there's a question or two from the community that they would like to ask. Are you good with taking the question? Sure. Sure. Let's do it. Awesome. So, folks, go ahead and um, on the Twitter spaces at We Are Metallicus, go ahead and raise your hand and we can take at least one question before the hour is up. And while somebody raises their hand, um, Igor, are you going to be making um, any event appearances? If so, where? <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, definitely. So as I said, the book's come out. Is that the time? Uh, my time schedule is quite full, as you can imagine. So one thing I'd like to mention maybe is that, uh, you know, I have a new, new Udemy course out uh, for blockchain masterclass for Corporations and businesses. I also have one for banks and financial professionals. By the way, I'll be, you know, at the, at the Vienna University of Business next week. Uh, I was also fortunate to do a part of the blockchain and crypto assets program uh, with the Singapore Management University, together with CFT in London. Uh, so it's another financial innovation um, hub. And uh, of course, I'm doing a lot of writing as well. So. If, if you're interested, for example, in regulation uh, in this space, in the big tech and, and blockchain space, I uh, just penned an OPAD in the American Banker this week. Uh, and next Tuesday, actually, uh, in my newsletter, I'll do an analysis on what Apple is doing and their strategy uh, in the financial industry. So make sure to subscribe. It's uh, the new frontier by me. And uh, yeah, subscribers also get a blockchain fundamentals course for free. So there's two reasons, actually, to subscribe. Cool. So where can we find the new frontier? Uh, either in, on Google or you, you can find it also on my website. It's igorpage.net. So I-G-O-R-P-E-J-I-C.net. Um, and yeah, you can find that also in my Twitter account. I guess it's linked here in Twitter spaces. Alrighty, alrighty. The week, the week is coming to an end. You're both big tech and finance. How to prevail in the age of blockchain, digital currencies, and Web3. It's officially out as of May 30th. It's Friday. What now? Well, I still have to, a lot of writing to do, unfortunately. Uh, but other than that, I think I'm going to enjoy the great weather. 
and just you know enjoy that it's out it's always a lot of anxiety once it, it hits the shelves uh but it's really it feels really great that it's out there uh, and the first feedback i'm getting is, is overwhelming so i think i'm just going to take a second um and enjoy enjoy that the book is out finally just let it all out or let it all in and so um and yeah it looks like you have it all right there in the back as we mentioned once again folks check it out on um amazon there's a few uh, few chapter samples in there. It was very informative for me. I thought it was awesome, so I can't wait to have it in my hands. And it looks like we do have a question. All right, Quantum, how are you doing? Sorry, microphone's on. Uh, very good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, doing great. You sound great. Okay, good. Go ahead, what's the question? Yes, sir. So a uh, question for, for the, the panel, I'll call it that. So, as you know, in, in the U.S. and in other jurisdictions, we pay taxes on digital assets that are deemed assets. And yet, in the financial advisor community, Lord help you if you mention that you have any digital assets and that you consider them uh, investor class. I'm going to turn my microphone off, but I'm just interested in hearing your opinion. Is that an opportunity as far as the spread? I'm not talking about price spread, but just call it whatever you want, a uh, regulation spread, the, the lag in the financial advisor community versus uh, whatever the, uh, the, the, the revenue, juris <clears throat> revenue um, jurisdictions are doing. I'm going to turn my mic off because there's some background noise. All right. So th thanks a lot for the question. Um, not 100% sure if I got that because of the background noises, uh, but uh, you're definitely right. You know, there's a lack of, of knowledge that there is with financial advisors, um, as far as I found out, also from tax advisors. You know, when when I ask my tax advisor how how should I uh, do staking rewards and stuff like that, uh, I just got a, got an answer. I have no idea. Please ask somebody else. So there is definitely an opportunity if if you want to go there. Uh, and uh, also the same thing with financial advisors. Definitely, uh, I think there's there's a lack of knowledge, uh, and but also unfortunately there's a lack of of clarity still on many things. Uh, and uh, I think oftentimes it's not even even them, but it, in terms of spread, if, uh, I'm not sure if I got the question there correct, but I think in terms of spread of, 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 of your uh, risks or your assets, of course, um, I've always been a very a big fan of, of spreading them uh, and never putting everything on one card, uh, especially, of course, with, with some something as volatile and with other uh, fraud, with other risks, uh, as we are talking here about crypto assets. So definitely. I hope that answers your question. Uh, if not, please feel free to. No, that that's that's really essentially it. Uh, thank you very Perfect. much. Um, I, I have the same uh, the same thought with my taxes as as you mentioned. Yeah. Where I end up doing all the research, all the work, and <laughs> hopefully everybody's happy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's the point. So thanks a lot for for the hint and for the question. It's it's. I think it's the same all over the world. So I think there's no jurisdiction where where. You get tax attorneys and then uh, investors, investment uh, advice that's really highly competent on the large scale. Thank you so much, Guadalajara, for your question. We always appreciate the questions that you all raise in to hear at Metallicans. All right, Igor, we're starting to come up on time. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave with anybody? Just that we're living in extremely exciting times. Uh, I was fortunate enough to find that out again during my last one and a half years. Uh, and every time we're reading the news today, <laughs> uh, it gets more and more interesting. You know, there's a lot of things happening. You mentioned it in the banking sector, in the blockchain sector, in the regulation sector. Uh, and all of these things coming together, uh, it's, you know, it's it's perfectly a great time to be in, in the blockchain space, in the financial space in general. So let's enjoy it and let's make the most of the opportunities that are presenting themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, that has been Igor Page, award-winning author of Blockchain Babel and... As we just mentioned earlier, just launched his new book, Big Tech and Finance, earlier this week in the United States and Canada. And it's everywhere else um, as of May 2nd. Am I correct? I think it was May 3rd, but it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. And it's all made somewhere at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anywhere else it's going to launch afterwards? or No, no, that's it. Now it's out. It's out everywhere around the globe. You can get it. <laughs> hey, you're good. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations, man, on that new book. I'm excited for you. I'm excited to read it. Um, once again, folks, you can find that book on Amazon, Big Tech and Finance, How to Prevail 
in the age of blockchain, digital currencies, and Web3, Igor Payich. I've been your host, Eric Williams. Thank you for an exciting episode of The Talk is Blood. Once again, everybody that's watching on YouTube or through our podcasting platform, which you can find Metallicus Live, follow us on Twitter at We Are Metallicus. Igor, do you have any socials you want to plug or um, the, any websites that you want to plug again? Yeah, definitely. My website, which is, is the most important hub, probably igorpage.net. So I G O R P J I C.net. Uh, on Twitter, it's igorpage9. Uh, and on LinkedIn, you can find me as well. We would we'll be very happy to connect. Uh, and once again, thank you very much for having me. It was a great talk. And I wish everybody a great weekend. Thank you.